Beautiful song and message fitting nicely with our topic today also. Happy New Year. It's strange to say that maybe on January 18, but it's my first time back with you collectively as a church family this new year. We enjoyed Christmas vacation in the States with family, but it's definitely good to be back home. Last Sabbath in Iowa, it was cold and snowy and icy. On Friday, actually, we drove from Kansas City up back to Iowa, and uh, it was raining in Kansas City when we left, and by the time we got to Iowa, it turned to ice. So it's raining ice, and our car is covered in ice, the windshield wipers are not working, the road is getting slick, and I said, Hollis, I'm off of this road, I'm not driving on this crazy stuff, I'm going to get a hotel. And that's what we did. So it's good to be back in, in uh, Lebanon, where there's no ice, in Beirut at least. You have to go up there to get to the ice and snow, and then you can play for a while and then leave. But there in Iowa, you're stuck in it all the time, at least from now on in this winter season that they're in. But MEU is about to start. I see students here. I see new students. We saw some new students last night at Vespers as well. Welcome back to our returning students. Welcome to our new students. We are glad you're here. This is your church. One of your churches, at least, Bushria Church is your church also down the hill. You're welcome to go there anytime. That's our Arabic-speaking church. I'm not the pastor of that church anymore, but I still support it 100%. And Pastor Fatty is the pastor there. He's doing a great job. And uh, so you're welcome also to, to support our church down the hill, as well as our other two churches in Lebanon uh, in, and the Adventist Learning Center as well, of course. But if you're happy here we're happy that you're here and we want you to be here with us in worship as we begin this new semester we realize that the economy in this country is facing some very serious problems the financial troubles of this country affect all of us whether you're Lebanese or from other Middle Eastern countries or whether you're from far away, like the United States of America, it affects all of us. And these financial challenges in the country affect our families and cause extra stress on our families. So today we're going to look at some key biblical principles that will help us survive and thrive in this time of financial turmoil. Now, don't be scared off by the title of the sermon, Money and Marriage. It's not just for married people. So if you're not married, don't feel like it's not for you. It's for you, too. It's for everybody here. I believe these principles will apply. But I also want to speak to the married people, at least at the start of this sermon, for a short little bit. Let's pray, though, before we continue further. Father in heaven, we've already been blessed We've thought of your faithfulness. We worship you this morning as our faithful God. And now, Lord, as we focus on some key principles from your word, please speak to us. Send your spirit to open our minds, transform our lives, give us peace in our lives in general, and even financial peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Money is a common source of conflict within marriage. It can also be a conflict in the church. If you come to church board meeting, sometimes we're talking about money. How much money should we spend on this or that ministry or what? Wait till we get to the, the new church uh, building that we're hoping to build. How much money are we going to spend on that? One million, two million, three million. We're going to have to talk about that. There's going to be opinions. But even in marriage, I have an opinion and Katie has an opinion. 
And I don't think we should spend money on that, but she thinks we should. She needs a new dress. I don't think she does. She has a hundred. <laughs> Fight! <sighs> Look at the results of this survey. It's in your study guide. Hope you got that study guide in your bulletin today. Hope it'll be useful for you. Let me pull mine out here as well. Here's what this survey said. Avenus families in North America, a 2009 survey of 1,397 Avenus in the North American division. Okay, so it's from the West. The results are compared with a similar study from 35 years previously in 1974 and 75. Here's what the result was. One of the results, there's many interesting facts from this survey, by the way. Here's just one of them. Money was the biggest source of conflict. 38% of people indicated that was true for them. Almost 40% of people said money is the biggest cause of conflict in our home. Could that also be true in the Middle East? Or do you not fight about money over here? They fight about oil over here, which equivalent is dollars, right? Money. Oil is money. So it's relevant for us because it affects us, our families, our marriages, our households. Dave Ramsey is a financial expert in the United States. Some of you have probably heard of him before. Here's what he wrote concerning this. He said, after years as a financial counselor and working with marriage counselors, I know that money and money fights are the number one cause of divorce, not to mention the thing that we fight about the most. But you don't have to fight with your spouse about money. There's a far better solution. The solution is communication. Now, some of you who are on committees all the time might find this humorous, but I would suggest you have a monthly budget committee meeting in your home with your spouse. It's a committee of two where you get together so both of you can give input into where your money's going to be spent. Not just the one who prepares the budget decides this. Both husband and wife prepare and agree on this. Who should prepare the budget, by the way? The man? We're in the Middle East. The man decides where the money goes, huh? Or the wife? Oh, I got different opinions here. We have a fight about this. <laughs> There's no right or wrong answer. Whoever has the natural gift with money should prepare the budget. That's what Dave Ramsey suggests. But the decision-making must be done by both. So you're an accountant, you love money, you love dollars and cents and all that, you do the budget, fine. But you bring it to your spouse and so you can talk about it and agree about it and even let your spouse change it because it is not the, the law of God written with his own finger that cannot be changed. Your budget can be changed by your spouse and you should let her change it or let him change it so that you can agree together on what you're going to spend your money on. Budget committee meetings should be kept short. Husband and wife don't go on for hours and hours no matter how much you love money. Your spouse won't love it that much. Begin the meeting with prayer. Pray about your finances as a couple. Ask God to help you be good managers of the money that he has given you. Communicate openly and honestly with your spouse about your financial priorities, your concerns, and your goals. Where are you headed financially? Do you have goals? Do you have priorities? Another key point, don't keep any financial secrets. Oh, I have this account tucked away over here, just some savings from a long time ago. My spouse doesn't need to know about that. Ooh, that's not nice. That's not healthy to keep secrets. Another tip, set long-term and short-term financial goals together. And together, read some financial books. Some authors I would suggest, Ed Reed, 
Larry Burkett or Dave Ramsey. These guys give you great biblical principles for how to manage your money in godly ways, biblical ways. Now that's the advice for the couples out there. You married couples out there, I hope you won't go home and fight about these. <laughs> go home and discuss these. Make a plan together financially. But let's look at some biblical principles that apply to all of us, whether you're married or not, married or single. Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. Don't go there too much in our Bibles during sermons, but it says that money... The money is God's, right? All the silver and the gold are his. So the money doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And we are stewards or managers of it. And if we're managing the money that is God's, that he's entrusted to us, we ought to find out how we should manage it. And how do we find out how to manage it? From his word. So we're going to focus today on four major principles of financial stewardship. The first principle, as you can see in your study guide, live on a budget. And grab your Bibles, please, and open them to Luke chapter 14. Luke what chapter? 14. Don't have it on the screen for you this morning because I want you to see it in your own Bible or your own device. Luke 14. And verse 28 is where we're going to start. These words are read in my Bible, which means Jesus is speaking. And here's what Jesus says. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus is implying that the man should have made a proper budget before he started building. And since he didn't do that, he ran out of funds and can't complete it. The principle we learn from this short illustration is that we should prepare a budget for our families. Many families don't do this, surprisingly. They just kind of wing it. And at the end of the month, they don't have enough money to pay all their bills. And then there's stress, and then there's a fight, and then what are you going to do? Some people, when they see the word budget, they're immediately turned off. Oh, that's a dirty word. I don't like that word. I don't want to hear that because it means boundaries and limitations. But boundaries and limitations financially are good thing. Don't let the word budget discourage you. It doesn't even have to be complicated. It can actually be quite simple. All a budget is is simply telling your money where to go before you spend it instead of asking where it went after you've spent it. That's logical. And that's wise. Living on a budget simply means spending less than you make. So what are the basics of a budget? Every family budget should include the basic necessities of life. What are those? Housing, food, clothing, transportation. These are basic necessities. You've got to have those in your budget. As Christians, a fifth basic category would be giving. With that said, sometimes churches focus only on the giving. You hear a sermon about tithe and offerings. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But there's more to financial management and financial teachings in God's word than tithe and offerings. God calls us to count the cost. Have a financial plan. Have a budget. Now, those keys we just talked about, housing, food, clothing, transportation, are those needs or are they wants? Needs. You need that stuff. We all need that stuff. We need a place to live. We need food to eat. We need clothes. We need a way to get around transportation, whether it's a taxi or whether it's a car. If we neglect to provide for our families in those areas, our families will be hurting a lot. Nobody wants their family out on the street homeless 
or hungry or stranded without a way to go around with transportation. Indeed, God's word calls us to provide for our families. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So we have a duty, a Christian duty, to provide for the needs of our families. That doesn't mean we buy everything they want. If my wife wants 105 dresses, doesn't need 105. Right? I didn't hear too many amens from the women. <laughs> Second key principle. Live debt free. This was our scripture reading that Marco read very nicely in English and in Arabic. Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. Now, notice this, this wording. The Bible doesn't say that debt is sin. If you're in debt, it's not a sin. Okay, The Bible doesn't say that. But it calls it slavery. Who wants to be in slavery? Oh, I don't see any hands. So while it's not a sin, it is slavery. And we don't want to be in slavery. Certainly not for our whole life. We can live debt-free. We can get out of debt. We can dig our way out, so to speak. It takes time. It takes hard work. Even the house, if you bought a house, you can pay that house off early. You don't have to take 30 years to pay it off. Pay it off early. The Bible clearly says the borrower is slave to the lender. When you owe money on a car or a house or a credit card, part of every salary or paycheck goes automatically to pay them. So basically, society has become a slave to itself. People have to work in order to pay off their debts. The Bible's practical counsel continues in Romans chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. So owe nothing, friends, except love. That's what we owe to each other, love. What does Ellen White have to say about debt? While helping to establish the Avondale School, where is Avondale, by the way? Australia. Ellen White counseled in 1896, there must be a strict regard to economy or a heavy debt will be incurred. Keep within the bounds or oh, live on a budget. Shun the incurring of debt as you would shun leprosy. Wow. Strong wording there. Would that, would that counsel to our sister institution in Avondale also apply to Middle East University? That's why we're not going to go in debt to build our new building, right? We're going to have to get the money beforehand. We don't want debt. We need the money in hand. We need to count the cost. So how do we get out of debt if you're in debt? The best way to get out is live within your income. Don't spend more than you make. It's really simple. Live on a budget. Stop borrowing money and systematically pay off your debts, starting with the smallest one and going to the largest one. Just think, if you had no debts, even the house is paid off, you wouldn't have this big mountain of debt in front of you anymore. And you could give so much more money to support God's work. You could save for emergencies and you could save for major purchases. Instead of going to the bank to get a car loan to buy your car, you save money and then you go buy the car. That's what they used to do in the olden days. Now the banks trick us into just borrowing it and then giving them all this money. That's why they have these huge buildings. Because they get money off the interest. If we live like no one else now, we get out of debt. Later, we can live like no one else, and we can give like no one else. 
we can give and help people and help the church. Third principle, saving and investing. In Genesis chapter 41, Joseph, remember good old Joseph in Egypt? He saved. He stored up food during the seven plentiful years in preparation for the coming seven years of famine. It's a good example for us. We need to save money for coming emergencies. You never know when an emergency is going to happen. You don't know if the car is going to break down tomorrow or a natural disaster will cause damage to your house. We've just been seeing uh, the news about volcanoes erupting and landslides coming and tidal waves and crazy things in nature. It's an emergency. You need to have an emergency fund. Or maybe there's a medical emergency that won't be fully covered by your health insurance. You need to have an emergency fund. Finance experts suggest we need to have an emergency fund of about three to six months of living expenses. That takes a while to accumulate that maybe. But it will never happen unless you start saving. Set it aside. Even students, you can work on this. And an emergency, by the way, is not Saturday night at midnight, I am hungry. I got to order a pizza. I got to pull money out of my emergency fund. That's not an emergency, okay? You got to put that in your budget. Pizza, Saturday night, money there. An emergency fund, you don't touch it unless it's a real emergency. Back in 2010, December, Katie and I had just finished at the seminary at Andrews University, and we were moving. Now, our story is interesting because we worked for Iowa Missouri Conference at, at that time, of course, and we finished, and we're moving, and we're going to start pastoring, but they did not tell us where we were going yet. But the moving truck was already at our house, so we were going to move, but we had no idea. We were like Abraham, wherever you lead us. And the moving trucks at our house were finishing up packing, and it's getting late at night. Angela, baby Angela, had just been born. Now she's a big nine-year-old, but she was a little one-month-old at this time. And uh, I've got a lot of books. Pastors like books. Don't we, pastors? Yeah. And so I was thinking, moving days tomorrow, I need to go get the dolly cart uh, inside so we're ready to haul the heavy books out on a dolly cart instead of carrying them, car carrying them one by one, you know, one box by one box. So I go out to the garage to get the dolly cart. By the way, do you know what a dolly cart is? I've got a picture up there for you in case you don't know. Oh, let's turn these lights off so you can see it better. That's a dolly cart. You've, you, you've seen them before in Lebanon, maybe. So I go out and grab that, and guess what I find? The wheels are flat. It's been sitting there for a while. <gasps> oh, no, I need to go fill up the tires so it's useful the next day. So I throw it in the back of my car, and I drive up to campus at Andrews to the air filling station. You know, they have one of these uh, automatic uh, air pumps to fill up tractor tires and car tires and that kind of stuff. So I rush up there, fill up these little tiny tires. It'll take just a second, right? And I'm out and back home. So I go there, pull it out of my trunk, get the, the hose, filling it up, psh, boom. My right hand was the one that was pushing the hose down to, on, on the knob to fill up the tire. So all the pressure from the explosion went right into my hand. And I broke my hand, three metacarpals. For those of you who are medical people, those are these right here, the metacarpals. So I broke these right here. Later on, I can show you my scars of the two pins that had to be inserted later on in surgery to, so my hand would heal straight. It was the most painful thing I've ever experienced. It must be much more painful than childbirth, I'm sure. <laughs> I fell down on the ground. I was wailing and weeping, and Katie's nowhere to be found. She's at home with the baby and with mother-in-law, and I have our only car. 
and nobody's around on campus because ca school's over. I'm like, I'm going to die out here in the snow, and who's going to help me? Thank God somebody was around and saw me, and they came over and said, are you hurt? That's a crazy question when somebody's on the ground wailing in pain. <laughs> yes, I'm hurt. I'm dying. My hand. And so they said, well, what do we do? You know, who do we call? And so I, tell, I told them to call my wife. I thought of my mother-in-law's cell phone number, who was there, called the number. This guy's talking to her and trying to explain what's happened. Katie's panicking. She rushes to get me with the neighbor's car, I think, because we only had one car, of course. Quite a mess. They hauled me off in an ambulance to the hospital, and uh, it was a terrible experience. Anyways, why am I telling you this sad story of my broken hand? It works good still. See? The same. I went to hand therapy with a guy who was a Sabbath keeper, of all things, amazingly, and he, and he helped me get my hand back working again after the surgery. I'm telling you all this because this was an emergency. And we needed an emergency fund to pay for the medical bills that were not covered by the insurance. Ambulance rides are expensive in America. And they were actually very rude to me on the ambulance. I was so upset about this. They'd sit there. I'm like, I'm in pain. You want me to sit here and we're just bouncing around on this wintry storm of snow? Oh, I was upset. We had an emergency fund. I didn't know I was going to have that accident. You don't know when an accident's going to happen to you. You don't know when an emergency is going to hit. Save money for an emergency. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20 says, There is precious oil, precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man swallows it up. What's that saying? It's saying that the wise will save but the foolish will spend all that they get. So do you want to be wise or do you want to be foolish? Should be an easy answer, but it requires a change of behavior. Dave Ramsey says personal finance is 80% behavior and only 20% head knowledge. In other words, many people have head knowledge about finances. Maybe I'm not telling you anything new during this sermon today. You say, oh, Pastor, I knew all that. Good. Good that you knew it. Are you doing it? That's the question. Is your behavior changed? Do you actually save money every month? Do you have an emergency fund? Or do you go shopping at the mall and everything that glitters and shines immediately calls for your money to disappear? And you spend it all. Saving for emergencies, for major purchases, and retirement even, is biblical. We should plan ahead for the future. God wants us to plan ahead. He wants us to be good stewards. As Larry Burkett says, it's important to balance planning for the future with trust in God's provision. In other words... Save for the future, save for retirement, but don't put your faith in the money, put your faith in God. Even your retirement account, if you have an account in the U.S. like I do, it could be wiped off. Stock market crashes, there goes retirement. Don't put your faith in that, put your faith in Him. But you should save anyways, because, well, Jesus is going to come before you retire, right? That's what some people said. And then they retired, and they had nothing. We can't live like that, friends. Yes, we want Jesus to come. Do we want him to come before this decade is over? Yes. Does that mean I shouldn't re save for retirement? No, I should save for retirement. And be ready in case he does not come. God has given us instructions as, as to how to handle the money he gives us. So we shouldn't act presumptuously and think God will supply for our needs when we have neglected to follow his instructions on how to handle the money he has already given us. Don't be presumptuous. If we, if we faithfully follow his instructions, we can rest assured that he will supply for our needs. 
So follow the counsel of his word. Live on a budget. Live debt free. Save and invest. The fourth principle and last one that we'll look at today is giving back to God in tithe and offerings. 10% of all that he has given us. The tithe or the tenth, the Bible says, is holy to the Lord. So let's make it practical. Many of you know this, but in case not, let's take a practical example. Let's say you make two million Lebanese pounds per month. Reasonable, right? Returning tithe on that amount would be how much? 10%. 200,000. Easy. And then offerings is beyond that. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So we honor God with our best, our first fruits. And he promises in his word to bless us, even to the point of overflowing. The Old Testament patriarch Jacob promised God that he would return a tenth of all that God gave him. Many of you have made that same promise when you were baptized and joined this church. On the baptismal certificate, in your baptismal vows, it mentions that specifically. It says, I believe in church organization. It is my purpose to support the church by my tithes and offerings and by my personal effort and influence. You took that vow. I took that vow. Are we staying true to that? And would we stay true to that even if our tithe for employees was not automatically taken out of our checks? We should. It should be a no-brainer, whether it's automatic or whether it's on our own accord. It's, it's automatic mentally because that's God's. It's not mine. I give it back to him. God clearly commands us to return tithe. In Malachi chapter 3, God's people had left him. They'd been robbing God, taking what belonged to him. If they had been faithful, then God would have poured out blessings upon them. Some people might wonder, well, pastor, we're in a crisis in Lebanon. We can barely get money out of the bank. How can we give tithe if we can't even get money out of the bank to buy groceries? It's a difficult situation we're in, no doubt about it. But does that mean we don't return tithe because we have challenges with the banks and because of the challenges in the country? Of course not. We should be faithful. What does the Bible say? Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 10. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. And pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Friends, there's no excuse. There's no reason to rob God of our tithe. Oh, I've got, I've got a lot of bills this month. I can't return my tithe. Wait a second. You can have a lot of bills every month. You'll always use that excuse. Don't give in to that excuse. Give God the tithe first. And trust that he will take care of your bills. If you're robbing God in tithes and offerings, that's actually contributing or probably the reason for your financial downfall. You're experiencing the curse it talks about in the Bible. God promises to take care of our needs. He asks for 10% and promises then to bless us so much, the rest of it, to overflowing. That's a generous God of love and grace. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus observes people as they give their tithe and their offerings, and the rich put in lots of money, but then a poor widow comes and puts in a few coins. Jesus said she gave more because she gave all she had. She gave in faith that God would take care of her if she obeyed him. 
So it's not about the amount of money you give. If you're rich or you're poor, God asks for the same amount, 10%. It is fair. We talked about fairness in Sabbath school a little bit. Totally fair. 10%, whether you have a million dollars or whether you have $10. Jesus told us in Matthew 6, verse 20, to store up treasures in heaven. That's what we do through tithe, when we return tithe and offerings. It's about faith, really. Do you believe God can take care and supply your needs on 90% of your income? I believe he can. He has. God makes the 90% go farther than the 100% would if I kept all 100%. Mathematically, that doesn't make sense in our minds. But I would challenge you, if you've not been returning tithe, start it. Try it. Test God and see. He will be faithful. He will show you. The 90% will go farther. God will provide for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, God loves a cheerful giver. Are you cheerfully giving, or is it just a, a grudge? Oh, I wish I don't have to do this. God can change our hearts so that we're giving cheerfully because we love him. Obedience to God should be because we love him, right? If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus says. If we love him, we return tithe and offerings. And when we think of Jesus giving up everything, dying on the cross to save us. He held nothing back. Surely, when we see his great sacrifice, we can make the sacrifice of giving him back his tithe and offerings. There's a great controversy going on between God and Satan. God has a plan for your money, and Satan has a plan for your money. Whose plan will you follow? Will you be like the foolish man who started building a tower before he counted the cost? Will you follow Satan's plan to be a slave to debt and creditors? Will you follow his plan to spend everything you make and not save anything for the future and withhold your tithes and offerings and rob God? Or will you follow God's plan of being disciplined, to live on a budget, spending less than you make? Will you follow God's plan to get out of debt getting out of financial slavery, saving and investing like Joseph did in Egypt and returning a faithful tithe and offering. I hope each one of us will choose to follow God's plan for our money. How will you respond? I put this in your study guide down at the bottom. I hope you'll check off those ones that you're planning to do or maybe you're already doing them and you recommit to doing them. Are you going to communicate openly and honestly with your spouse? Then check that one. Are you going to count the cost and live on a budget? New plan for 2020, live on a budget? Check that one. Shun debt like leprosy and pay off those debts as soon as possible? Check that one. Pastor, I'm going to save like Joseph. Yes, emergencies are coming. Let's save. Check that one. Or maybe you're going to start returning tithe and offerings. Or maybe you've already been doing that, but you haven't been doing it cheerfully. Maybe you can check that one. You're going to do it cheerfully now. Dave Ramsey says, every day at the end of his radio station, this catchy and very true sentence, and I'd like to end our message this morning with it. There's only one way to financial peace, and that is to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. You want to have financial peace? Walk daily. Every day. Kill yom. My favorite Arabic phrase. Every day. Kill yom with Jesus. Every day with Jesus. And you'll have financial peace. That's the only way you're going to have is with your, when you're connected with him. So may God help us. May the Prince of Peace help us all have financial peace this year. Amen.